Hello and welcome to Black, Brown, and Bilingue, where our mission is to unite the black and brown communities through education, storytelling, and community engagement. So Brett and I, when we were newlyweds, he, we're completely opposites. He's much more logical. I'm definitely much more emotional. And he introduced me to the cosmos with Carl Sagan. And as newlyweds, that's what we would watch. Like our parents would call us, oh, are you guys doing anything exciting as newlyweds? And we were like, just watching the cosmos. <laughs> as it should be. That's how it should be. Yeah. Right? And, and we loved it. And so then that naturally led to Brett introducing me to you and then when we found out that you were redoing the cosmos we were ecstatic how did that happen the re the the one from 2014 or the one from 2020 oh i don't know there was a 2021 what i'm watching yeah, the, the 2021 now yeah yeah there's the 2020 which uh, aired I'm in march about the 2014. on national geographic march 2020 right at the beginning of the pandemic and it aired on Fox in the fall. Mm -hmm. And before Disney bought National Geographic from Flock, Fox flagship, they would have aired sort of in synchrony with each other. But now they had separate programming schedules. And because they the, there was a divorce, basically, between mm -hmm. them. I, I assume it was a happy divorce. I'm not sure. But um, Fox got split out between Fox News, Fox flagship, Fox Business, Fox Sports and Fox, 20th Century Fox, Fox Studios, Fox Animation, and all the rest of that. Disney picked up all of that. So, so that separated it on the calendar. But the way it happened was I, I'd met Andrian, who is Carl Sagan's widow. Oh. And she is, um, was behind the scenes on so much of his productivity. That, but he was, so, he was so luminous that it was hard to see anybody who might have been around him. But if you look at the credits in the original Cosmos, 1980, she is co-author of that series. Oh. And so Carl Sagan dies in, I think, 1996, if not early 97. And I meet Anne. Uh, at, there was a, a meeting of people of like mind uh, in California. And we chatted. I'd met her before, but then the topic came up. Isn't it time to sort of do Cosmos again? And I was asked if I was interested and at the time I said, sure, but there are plenty of people who will want to host this. I don't need to host it. I got other things I'm doing. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. I did have these encounters with Carl Sagan when I was in high school. And it was so influential that if I hosted, I'd be able to bring some of that to what I say and, and, what, and what we script. And so I thought to myself, yes, it would, I would be irresponsible if I didn't. Aww. agreed to host Cosmos. And so I did. And but it's a huge production and money and time. Yeah, and yeah. And, and so people say, oh, when's the next season coming? They think it would just knock these out <laughs> <laughs> every nine months. But no. So uh, that, that 2014 was successful. It translated into 147 languages, 180 countries. So that was enough to sort of justify another one. And so we just did another one. And this latest one is Cosmos Possible Worlds. Wow. Which is very hopeful, um, a very hopeful um, exploration of what yeah. we know about the physical universe and how we can use that to the benefit of our survival and the survival of our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so it's 13 episodes on that. You definitely did and, it, Justin. And Adrian is still, is still, you know, she, she's like the lead writer on it. Wow. So she, she's actually the secret sauce in right, right. Because she, though not a scientist herself, she's hyper scientifically literate and she feels the universe. So whereas a scientist will just deliver the facts, she'll say, well, I wonder how those facts fit into my sort of soul of curiosity, into my, my kind of girl. attitudes of concern about my fellow humans. And that's 
why Cosmos lands differently from any other documentary you've ever seen. In fact, you can't even use the word documentary. It doesn't fit what mm -hmm. Cosmos is relative to a traditional documentary you might view. Yes. So I, I just want to say I'm watching it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm watching it um, episode by episode on Disney Plus. And um, yeah, now I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm just like, whoa, you sound exactly the same. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sound exactly the same. Well, you thought so, there was some sort of voice modulator. You know? Right, right. Well, because it's just so smooth, Neil. I don't know if anybody's ever told I you. I don't think you. about it. I don't know. And, no, and I'm not even trying to be. You want me to be smooth? I'll be smooth. And now. <laughs> hey, that r and radio me. voice that R, you know late night late true. night with neil degrasse tyson you know what I'm saying? <laughs> after hours <laughs> after, yeah yeah so yeah so you, you you talked about kind of these interactions with um carl sagan um and then it kind of brought you to this production um but i would argue that that even prior to Cosmos 2014, your name was a name that was known. Um, and, and it's so interesting to think about like a famous astrophysicist, right? Um, I wonder, uh, again, you know, this is Black, Brown, and Bilingue. And so I, I want to jump kind of into that topic to some degree. Do you think, because um, Lisette and I just recorded an episode on, on, on exceptionality. And about the idea that people like look at me and they're like, oh, look at this black guy and he speaks Spanish and like, you know, that's impressive. And, and some of those things. Do you think that your racial identity has played a role in kind of the fame side of your work um, and, and, and being known a little bit more? Uh, it's hard to judge that. If I were to give a first quick answer, I would say no. And I base that on the fact that the fame was not overnight, all right? Maybe some people first learned of me in 2014 with Cosmos, but as you, I think, accurately described, I was already well-known. I'd been in documentaries. I'd been on Jon Stewart, and uh, by then I already had a, a significant Twitter following, millions of followers um, at that time. And so uh, I've been able to track this rise in visibility uh, quantitatively even. And one interesting way to do that is you simply count the rate that a total stranger recognizes you on the street. If we go back to the 1990s, it was about one a week. Okay, that was kind of interesting. If the previous number is zero forever, <laughs> when that starts <laughs> happening one a week, it's like, oh, okay. And then it was like two a week. And then it was five a week. And this was a slow thing. None of this was an abrupt slope change, okay? Five a week. And then sort of 10 a week. And then five a day. And then 10 a day. And right now, it's, it's full sort of celebrity level. Mm -hmm. So um, it would be thousands in a day. If I, I, there's a point where I had to start wearing a hat, you know, dark sunglasses, whatever, to just to tamp some of that down. So, but what my point is, that was so systematic and gradual, there was no point where I can say, oh, this is happening because I'm black or I'm not black or, or, or whatever. I, there was no, and, and I specifically, this show accepted, by the way, I specifically decline invitations to public events where the foundation of that invitation hinges on my skin color. Mm -hmm. So let's go to February, Black History Month. Um, I get invitations to give talks, appearances, and that number goes up during Black History Month. And what I say to them is, um, if you only thought of me because I'm black during Black History Month, then I must not really be succeeding as a scientist because everything I do as a scientist has nothing to do with my skin color. Right. Ever. So mm -hmm. I say, invite me at some other time of the year if it occurs, you to, occurs to you to do so. So the number of occasions I am in an interview or in a situation where I'm discussing being black is extremely small. However, the public has a very real interest in that. And I know this because those 
very few cases where I'm discussing issues that surround skin color have very high views on YouTube, for example. Millions of views. Whereas other views, I'm just talking about science, they can do well, but not that high. Right. So people can get a distorted impression of me always talking about race, but mm -hmm. the fact is I don't. And I specifically reject interviews where that is the foundation of why they want to have the interview. I don't mind it coming up after, mm -hmm. during, mm -hmm. but if they, I, we need a black person to know, find someone else. Find someone where being black is part of their public identity, active sure. public identity. Mm -hmm. It's not part of my active identity. Other than that, you see me as that. It's not part of anything I talk about. I don't specialize in programs for black people or for black children or the inner city or any of that. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's, it's actually strategic because I was worried, getting back to your point, um, Maurice, that, that I have discovered over time that the more I am thusly associated with such causes and issues, the less people think of me as, an, as a scientist independent of that. And yeah. I end up getting constricted by the expectations of others. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, um, we kind of touched upon that in our uh, exceptionality uh, episode where it, it's so interesting because, you know, as a person of color, we often feel like we carry the burden of our whole group, right? And, and it's really not fair. And, you know, there are times where it's like, okay, I'm gonna do this so that to kind of break the glass ceiling, so to speak. But what I've realized is that the higher you move up, you're not really, people don't necessarily view you as, um, oh, wow, look at Lisette, she's a woman, she's, a lead, she's in a leadership role, she's Latina. It's more like she's an exception. Like, it, and, and so when you think you're, moving away from stereotypes, it, that's not always the case. And so I also, when I started in my career, felt like I was being pigeonholed as like, you can only be a bilingual teacher. If I applied to a general education uh, position, it was like, why would we waste that talent? Why would you let your ability to speak Spanish go to waste? And I watched an interview of yours where you talk about, um, in college, I believe it was like you're in wrestling and you talk about um, a black teammate who told you that, you know, the black community could not afford to lose uh, you pretty much to astrophysics. They couldn't afford right, that. Right, because he was, he was majoring in economics and he was, in fact, he became a Rhodes Scholar. He, he was, you know, did research on enterprise zones in the inner city. He was doing the black thing. Mm -hmm. and and that's we need that mm -hmm. we need that but then he then he put some pressure on me to also do the black thing and that was a very deep hole that he put me in because i i knew sort of intellectually he he was right right what am i doing studying astrophysics when the world has the problems that it has and i can bring sort of my energy and uh, uh, mental efforts to at least try to soften the problems if not solve them entirely and but i knew in my heart that i really loved the universe and so i had an, a, a battle between my heart and my mind that mm -hmm. went on for 20 years and it wasn't until i saw this is in the 1990s now um i there was an explosion on the sun and this worried the news and I was in graduate school at the time. And so they, the local news called the astrophysics department at Columbia University. That's where I was looking to get someone to comment on the explosions on the sun. What effect will that have on earth? And, uh, it was at, during lunch when they, the phone call came in and all the faculty were out to some meeting and having lunch and I was there in my office. So that the sec, the main uh, admin sent the call to me. And so I said, hi, I'm a uh, doctoral candidate, but how can I help you? Oh, tell me about the sun. Well, the sun is active and it gurgles and it burps <laughs> up gases every now and then. And occasionally they point towards Earth. And these are charged particles. They travel very fast. They see Earth's atmosphere and our magnetic field. And they get spiraled and collide down at the poles, rendering the sky aglow. And we get the aurora borealis from this. What do you mean? So Earth is going to be okay. I said, Earth is going to be fine. 
And she said, oh, by the way, can you come to studio and say that on camera? And there I'm, I'm a graduate student with like funky t-shirt and shorts. And so I went home and put on my one tie and my one jacket and my one button up shirt they <laughs> the car to pick me up. We go down and we recreate that conversation with the weatherman because the weather guy is the only person who's truly scientifically literate on the, in most uh, news floors. And, and then I go home and that was pre-recorded, obviously. And I go home and I watch that interview at the end of the day. And I had a kind of an out of body experience. There's the first one. Well, I'm here, so how can I be there if I'm here? That was that's the <laughs> that's the rookie, right, <laughs> the rookie right. state of mind when you first right. see yourself on television, right? How's that? How's that even possible? Um, and then I watched it, and at no time did the person who was conducting the interview say, "Well, how do black people feel about this? Does this have a different effect on black skin? Is there at n- nothing about being black came up in that conversation. And I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, I have never in my life seen an interview with a black person who was not otherwise an entertainer, an interview with a black expert that had nothing to do with being black. I'd never seen that before. I I may have been the first one. I said, there had to have been others. So, because, you know, ever drive a new car and everybody else has your same car because your, your awareness factor switches. Yep. So I said, well, if it's not the first one, I ought to see some more of these as I go forward. So let me look for them. Sure enough, there's the black dancer, singer, athlete, okay? And, the, and anyone else who's black who's interviewed for expertise, it has to do with response to the unrest in, in Harlem, or it's a preacher who's trying to get the, or it's a, and, and they all have to be black for those interviews. And so mm-hmm. then I realized that if instead my life were devoted to being an expert without having to reference being black, then people will have a reference point or at least have a chance of accomplishing that. And what is the stereotype? Well, they just drove their car, but this happened in the 90s up to the red light, and there's the guy with the squeegee trying to beg money from you after they clean you. They were all black in New York City, where I grew up. Okay, mm-hmm. surely in Chicago, this is tr- was true as well. So if you're a white person in the car, you see a black person clean, it's like, oh, these black people, you're either liberal about it and you say, oh, they need opportunity, they need this, or you're sort of angry conservative. Um, whatever you're thinking... Are you thinking this person could be an astrophysicist? But the fact is you just saw an astrophysicist on television with dark skin tell you Earth is going to be okay because the explosion on the sun that just happened is not going to harm us because of our magnetic field. So my sense of it was the next time you see a black person who commits a crime, a black person who is in homeless, a black person who is squeegeeing your car, you can now think to yourself... Is there a reason why this person did not become an astrophysicist? That is incredibly powerful, and it, it is. It is. Something... I didn't. I didn't dig out of the hole until that moment. Yeah, and I said, "I'm glad I didn't. I was not influenced by that by that assault, mm-hmm. verbal assault on my life's ambitions." Hmm. Yeah. I I think. Uh, and I really appreciate you sharing that, Neil. That's incredibly powerful. Even as I, you know, uh, sit and reflect on that idea that while my work as a principal is not tied to me being black, I am very aware of the fact that for most people that I serve, I'm the first black principal, right, that, that they see. And so now, right, what does that imagery mean? Um, to, to them and, and, and how will it change perhaps the way that they look at other people um, who look like you or look like me. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. So thanks for, for sh- and, and sharing that reflection. If you've never seen a black person, that's same with women, of course, right? If, it's, mm-hmm. if a woman is an astronaut or the first astronaut, those usually make headlines and you kind of in a perfect world, you don't want them to make headlines. You want them to be so common that it goes unremarked upon. 
I'm old enough to remember, was his name Doug Williams? He was a quarterback, a starting quarterback in one of the Super Bowls of the 1990s, okay? First black starting quarterback. Well, that was headline news because there remained a faction of people saying and th- thinking, if not saying, the reason why there are no black quarterbacks is because that requires the most brains. And you, black people don't have the brains, and they, 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 if they're, they might be thinking it even if they're not saying it. And so, so what he did in that role, he broke like three records, three Super Bowl records. And then it stopped. Um. Sorry. What I mean by stopped is no one talked about black quarterbacks anymore. They just were black quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. No, it no longer became a conversation point in the news analysis of a game. Mm-hmm. And, and but 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 certainly was when I was growing up. We have three black players today. We have two black. There, there's no, that that was a it was a scorecard. Mm-hmm. Is anyone mentioning how many black players are on a team when they're calling the game? No, in basketball, baseball, no, they're not. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good thing. Overall, certainly. definitely, it's no, longer, it's no longer something to remark upon. Yeah, I, I've seen interviews where you, you know, you've made mention of like when people ask you, what race are you or what are you? You you talk about, you know, I am part of the human race. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're all genetically connected. So if you want to start dividing people up, I, I, that sounds so tribally artificial to me. Mm-hmm. Um, any two people in the world has a common ancestor. Any two people. All right. Uh, it's, just, it's just how far back you have to go to find the common ancestor to two people, however separate you want to make them. And those common ancestors are sprinkled throughout the history of the human lineage. And so so we're all related. Uh, and so I think of all of humans as family. I think of all of, of uh, the species as one race, if you will. And see, and, and to me, that's, I wish that as a society, we were almost to that level. It, to me, it's like very, you're enlightened, right? You, you think beyond what I think many of us uh, think about. It's a cosmic perspective. I try to always have as high a level perspective as I can on challenges mm-hmm. and problems and, that we face. Mm-hmm. And it's not to ignore the problems, but it's to try to elevate people's attitudes to a higher um, plane, Mm-hmm. where it's like when you're in space and you look back at Earth, it doesn't look like the schoolroom globe that you grew up with, with the color mm-hmm. coded countries. And no, no, it's just land and ocean and clouds. That's what you see. Mm-hmm. Yet if you zoom in, there are people killing each other for stepping over a line in the sand or for worshiping someone different or for sleeping with someone different, loving someone different, worshiping a different God. We are finding all manner of ways to tribalize and produce conflict, whereas the cosmic perspective says otherwise. Mm-hmm. And part of that is the fact that uh, we're really scientific illiterate, right? And you've also made mention that it's the adults. We need to become scientifically literate because children are naturally inquisitive and they ask questions. And I'm not worried about the kids at all. At try. all. So we, being educators, what do you think we're missing? Like, I think how can we get that? Yeah, I don't have a silver bullet right now, but although I'm mm-hmm. working on one. <laughs> <laughs> got a whole lab. I'm working on it. I promise you. But uh, as a starter thought, which may be a little half baked, right? Because it's still in the oven. Uh, so I admit that or confess that. So g- allow me the latitude to think freely without having fully researched this because you're asking. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to me the problem with the school system. By the way, it's easy for me to say when I'm not in the school system and I'm not a teacher in the school system, I'm not a principal. So I can just say, oh, your problem, your problem is, I, you know, you probably get that a lot, okay, from teachers, I mean, from, from parents, from, you know, city council, whomever. But it seems to me that the attitude that we have at the end of the school day, <clears throat> the school bell rings, 
school's out and you go running out or or it's it's may or june and it's the last day of school before summer school's out summer is here or it's graduation and people toss up their caps why are they tossing up their caps because they're celebrating no longer being in school so what's going on inside the school where people can't wait for it to end and they celebrate when it ends. What, what what's when your only job as a student is to learn how is it that learning can be made so unpleasant that people would rather not learn than learn to me that's that's that, that's a stupefying fact so that school whatever is going on in the school in my opinion it needs to stimulate a love of learning it needs to stimulate curiosity so that on the last day of school you're sad that no longer will you formally be able to learn with friends and with experts but you are trained to be curious about what you don't know and you can become a lifelong learner because you will spend much more time after school much more time not in school after you've graduated than you ever spent in school mm -hmm. so if you all your learning only happened in a classroom with a teacher then you have shortchanged your, the, the potential enlightenment you could have achieved just by being human in this modern world. So the school needs to um, change, work on how to create an attitude where people embrace learning. And I think when you get that, you will never have adults who are ossified in whatever it was they learned 20 years ago because they didn't keep learning because they didn't want to keep learning because they were glad school had ended, but that's how they're running their life. And they're not open to a new idea, to a new thought, because they're not curious. Curiosity and wonder, especially, are the twin engines of exploration and discovery. And exploration and discovery are the pathways to finding out what is objectively true in this world. And everyone who is embracing something that's not true, often they don't have an, any idea of what role the bias they carry is playing on their interpretation of the truth. It could be religious bias, political bias, cultural bias. Um, uh, or the bias is where you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. That's dangerous, especially in a pluralistic society, because that can only end badly. The the I've I've never quite thought about and and it's such a it's such a trope right it's it's like something that you see in movies the school bell rings and kids excitedly they dance they break in the you know um, choreographed dance because school <laughs> is now that's when the choreographed over. dance kicks in you're exactly right <laughs> yes right in the corridors as everyone spills out or or on the <laughs> steps coming down the street exactly yes yes. Um, because school is finally over and and that is uh i think that's a challenge to me as a principal i hope you know i think that's a challenge to us as an education system i recognize i'm part of that system to say what do we need to do differently now oh, if, one other if, thing just to toss it in there yeah. just to just to be a little controversial um the i'm gonna say two things uh because you're in the school system, I'm going to say two things. Um, we all, you know, if you're an educated person, you begin through high school and maybe college, then you had dozens of teachers in your life. Maybe as many as 50. Okay. All right. That's how many teachers you've had. Ask yourself, how many of all of those teachers were like singularly influential on you and gave you a whole new outlook on learning how many it's like this many that many it's not this many mm -hmm. it's not 10 it's not five maybe it's a two or three and i've done this survey anytime i have a room of thousands of people i say how many teachers were really significant more than five raise your hand there's like two people raise their hand most people are between two three at most four so what i appeal to you is well, who are those teachers? These are teachers that love their work and they bring that love into the classroom and their love is palpable. I, I didn't want to say infectious because we were just coming out of a pandemic. Their <laughs> love is palpable, okay? No, not <laughs> infectious. And the, and the students feel it and they enjoy learning and they're sad when that class ends. 
So my challenge to teachers is be that teacher for your students in your life. Mm. And that means most teachers will fail that test because we all know who these great teachers are. It's not a secret. Everyone talks about them. Mm. Who's your favorite teacher? That person shows up every single time. And it's not only whether they give you high grades. The students are better than that. They know your favorite teacher is one who you enjoy being in their class. I think that's what we need more of in the school system. And since they exist, we don't have to print it out of whole cloth. Find out what they are, analyze them, put them in the cloning machine, and get to work on <laughs> You're so right, because when I think of my favorite teachers, it's that love. You felt the love in the room. And, and, and how many were there? Tell me. How tres. many teachers were there? Three. <laughs> tres. Mm -hmm. Tres. Maurice, tres. how many? Um, man, right off, not including college, both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but at not, you know what? I'll say in college, though, I had a few more. I, in college, I really did have a few more. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and, but of course, college is not what we we're talking about here. Right, right. 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 K through 12. But yeah, so that's a good sign that the college had a few more. For me, it's like two and a half, mm -hmm. two and a half. And that love, you know, when I think of the one that especially had an impact on my life, it might have not, it, it wasn't necessarily like rainbows and you're the best class. It was tough love. But I knew that that teacher cared because yep. he was being tough. And, you know, it, it, you're so right that we can all name them, but unfortunately they're there's so few of them. And then also as adults, often we're the ones that feed into, oh, I can't wait for summer break. The kids, they enjoy learning for the most part. A lot of them hate going home for well, the Well, the really summer. young ones, I think when you get to the middle school and high school, you get this sort of the cynical attitude towards learning mm -hmm. because it's either it's not cool or, you know, you'd rather be doing something else. You'd rather be dating, whatever. Mm -hmm. so, do so, you think you've made it cool? I'm sorry, Maurice. I know, but I, the, the questions are just coming to me. Well, I got one more. I was going to add that second point. Go ahead, uh, I go tweeted ahead, go ahead. this once, and the tweet was turned out to be controversial, but it's just a statement of fact. And But I think people didn't realize it. It was a simple statement of fact. And that is, um, oh, by the way, you were saying it was tough love. And by the way, you can have a favorite teacher even if you didn't get an A in their class because yep. they, they challenged you in ways that no other teacher could. So... The, the best of the teachers is not whether you got an A in their class. You could have, you might have, but that's not what made them the best teacher. All right. Exactly. So here it is. Uh, students who get straight A's do so not because of good teachers, but in spite of bad teachers. Yes. That is, that is an objectively, logically true statement that ruffles many teachers badly. Because they want to believe that if they're a good teacher and then they, because I've seen this, teachers call me up, I have this straight A student and they're in my class and can I bring them to you? And they want to like heap extra attention on these straight A students as though they had something to do with it. Think about it. If I get an A in your class and you're a good teacher and I get an A in your class and you're a really bad teacher, then the teaching talents that you express are not relevant to my performance. Mm -hmm. If I get a high grade in your class and you're a great teacher and a low grade in a class that has a bad teacher, then my learning ability is linked to whether or not you're a good teacher. But I'm not a straight A student. I get A's in the good teachers and low grades with the bad teachers. If I get bad grades with good teachers and bad grades with bad teachers, then I'm a bad student because the quality of the teacher had no effect on my performance. Mm. So the straight A students have rendered you, the teacher, basically irrelevant. Amen. It's, it's hard to admit, but it's true. It, I could see it, how it, that could be controversial. It's controversial, <laughs> but it's not controversial for any logical reason. It's no, exactly. Like, no, I'm exactly. a good teacher and I matter and I this and I that. I'm, I'm not saying you're not a good teacher. Just don't parade your straight-A students and believe you had anything to do with their learning. You know what? Yes, I agree a thousand percent because when we get in these data discussions and we try to figure out who we can, you know, provide additional interventions with or support, we have had that conversation where, like, there's this group of high-achieving students that are going to learn regardless of who their teacher is. 
Yeah, and don't of pretend them. like it, th this is happening because you have a great school. The great school is the one where there's students who's ready to drop out and you convince them to stay in and then they get like a C plus average when they might have dropped out. That's, that's a school that's working, all right? Or a student who's getting a C minus and you encourage them and then they get an A, an A, an A minus. Oh my gosh. Now, you t now I'm ready to have that conversation with that teacher. <clears throat> but not the teacher who parades their straight A student. I, I have no patience for that. So, so Neil, I wanted to ask, we're, we're talking about K-12 <laughs> education and, and straight A's, and we are talking to someone who is probably considered one of the most intelligent men in the world. What, what, if, if we were to step it back to when you were just Neil, the, the little boy or the young man being raised by, by two parents who, who uh, you know, from what I've read, were well-educated themselves. Um, what, what was school like for you? And, and then more specifically, when did you kind of realize you had a knack for like this thing that you do that is definitely different from a lot of other areas of study? Yeah. So a knack implies that you have some ability that just sort of shows up out of the blue. That's what a knack means. I think that's how you're using the word. Um, but what that does is it, it does not allow me to have worked hard at anything you are thinking is a knack. So I enjoyed school my whole life. I enjoyed it. I, I was, not that I was sad at the end of school, but I didn't see the end of school day as some, as a, a joyous occasion. I didn't. Um, my grades were sort of average. Um, no teacher, because they're cued on your grades. This is, this is their metric for you to assess your promise and performance as an adult for the rest of your freaking life. I had, I, I had, was a B student throughout my entire life in, in middle school, high school, college, graduate school, B, B. And in there, I got A's, B's and C's. So I get the full mixture. What that means is there is no teacher at any time who, if you ask them, would point to me in the classroom and say, Oh, see that guy, Tyson, he'll go far watch him he, and they're not they don't have the capacity to make that judgment because they're only basing it on grades not on ambition not on curiosity not on what you're doing outside of school not on what hobbies you might have not how many books you're reading only on the grade you're getting in their class that those are the measures that are invoked not on what grit you might have for having fallen down but then get back up and and stand up stronger than you were before. None of that is encoded in any of the exams that are given. All right, so you want to go back to young Neil? Uh, I was interested in science since I was nine years old, the universe specifically. And I read a lot. I enjoyed television, but I also liked reading books where I could learn. One of my regrets, but it's just part of who I am, is I read vastly more nonfiction than fiction. I think I could have learned a little bit more about human behavior, human decision-making, had I read more uh, stories about people. Um, but when I'm not learning about people, I was learning about the universe. So there's a trade-off there. I do enjoy, enjoy watching movies, which are themselves works of fiction mostly. And so, but anyone who's read the book say, oh, the movie wasn't as good as the book. Okay, <laughs> fine. But if I'm not reading the book at all, give me at least the movie, all right? Uh, give me, give me some, cut me some slack here. So uh, that's what I was growing up. So, yeah. Were, was there ever a time where you're like, my brain is like a scientist? Or was there ever a time where like, my, my brain is just different? Did you, are you ever able to shut it off? Because like I mentioned earlier, my husband is extremely logical and I'm going to be very transparent. That actually led to some, some conflict because I was more on the human behavior side and he was just very, you know, one track mind, I guess, or not one track mind. Um, he just thought, thought of things as a very logical, in a very logical way. And I, I'm, I'm comfortable in the gray area. Did you ever come to that realization? Like, I just can't turn off the scientific thinking. Uh, so I was very logical brained through high school. And that all changed in my first year of college when I took an art class, an art survey class. Mm. And I'm hearing artists and designers speak in a language I had just never heard before. And I was initially very 
I found it very off-putting uh, to hear an artist, I'm standing in front of an easel with charcoal, and there's a model who we, we're supposed to draw who's posing in the middle of this art studio. And, oh, sorry, that was a different example. The name I want to give here is they play music. And they, I still have the charcoal. This is the charcoal unit. And there's an easel in front of me. And the, and the, 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 the command is draw the energy in the music. <laughs> I've had to do that before. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? What the? F no, I'm not. I, energy is one half mv squared equals mc. I know what energy is. It's very precise. It's not anything charcoal does on a piece of paper in response to music. So, so this I spent a year in these kinds of situations with artists, at my teachers, professors, and about halfway through. A little early, more soon, a little sooner than halfway through, I snapped. It was like, okay, my brain is now different <laughs> than it was. <laughs> and can I tell you, I snapped. Um, it was in October, I think. They got a bunch of gnarly pumpkins. They brought it into the art studio, and they just piled them up in front of the room. These are pumpkins that no one was buying for Halloween, so they were kind of funky, weird shaped. And we spent a week drawing pumpkins. There they were, stacked at angles. I'm one of the world's best pumpkin drawers because of that episode, by the way. So there it is. And all right, I can do that. Nothing irrational or logical about that. So after we spent what felt like two weeks, but it was probably only one week drawing pumpkins. Then the, and they were all stacked. Okay. Then they gave a different command. They said, oh, this week, draw the space between the pumpkins. And it was like, whoa, I don't even know what that means. What do I do? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so here I spent 10 days, at least, giving meaning to the existence of pumpkins in front of me, which now become the boundaries to something where there is no pumpkin, and that place where there's no pumpkin is the thing I'm drawing. Okay, so the whole lead up to that moment was me resistive to this fuzzy talk of artists. And in that moment, my brain just snapped. And since then, I declare that I've been able to have meaningful conversations with people whose thoughts and emotions and attitudes about the world lives in the gray zone <laughs> that you're talking about. Yeah. In that zone where what you feel matters as much as whatever logic you're bringing to the table, because we are human. And humans run this world. So that's when the, it's happened rather abruptly, I would say. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I'm sure my brain was percolating, ready to sure. bust open up right up to that moment. And it's that moment that I remembered distinctly where I was a different person afterwards than I was before. Right. And now, now I find myself talking about, I talk to artists or architects and I say, can that room be given a little more energy? <laughs> You see this fuzzy talk. I am totally guilty of everything that I was so re rejecting of at the beginning of that uh, session. So, so well, there it is. And I love that that the background you chose uh, for Zoom today, right, is is this beautiful painting. This this is Starry Nights, is that correct? Yeah, Starry Night. In fact, it's, it's related to this whole story I just told you because I could put a Hubble photo back there and I have plenty of them and I love them all, but uh, then it would just be a photo. Whereas this is clearly not what Vincent van Gogh saw because that, the skies never look like this. But what, but what it is, is most definitely what he felt when he saw it. And I, I embrace that. I'd like, that's what I want artists to do. I want them to go around and help us feel the world around us. Yeah. It's like a universal line for me to ask that question and you <laughs> pick that picture as your background. See, <laughs> that's what the emotional person in me would say, like, ah, oh, it all worked out. Yeah. <laughs> So I do want to, I want to reference uh, just one other video um, that, that I listened to as we were excitedly, and I don't know if I said this earlier, how excited we are to have you on, but we just want to really reiterate that we really respect um, and think highly of the work that, that you do. And 
um, again, I think, I think um, that you talk about it a little bit in, in this video that, that we got a chance, um, but it was a video um, that I watched of a piece that you wrote this summer um, uh, called A Reflection uh, on the Color of My Skin. And, um, and I think it pairs really well with what you've told us already today, that that is not, you have not defined your work and in fact have been strategic in not talking about race because you are a scientist, right? And, and I think we, 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 we see that. So I, um, I guess what I'm wondering though, is as you, as you wrote that piece and you talked at the beginning about sitting at this, um, conference with other astrophysicists. And here I am, a, a, a black male educator, and, and I want to acknowledge something. My bias was such that I assumed you were sitting there with other white men or European men or, or men. I, I, and so when, the, when you get to the point in which you say, I was at the national uh, meeting for black physicists, I was like, oh my goodness, Maurice, the system has a hold even on you that you <laughs> thought in your mind. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I'll admit that. And I think I learned from that. But but I do want to say, um, first off, thank you for writing that piece, because I think that it spoke uh, very powerfully about the situation. The My question for you, Just to remind though, people that I, I could not stay silent in the face of what was going on outside my window in New York City, the protests, the 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 George Floyd in response to primarily George Floyd, but basically the entire uh, endemic um, system in which we live, and I just couldn't stay silent. So that's why I, I upped with that. That yeah. Bit. So, so thanks for noticing it. But yeah, go on. I interrupted. No, that's okay. I I appreciate that. I I just wanted to say, you know, I, I guess I was wondering, as you wrote that piece, did did you receive um, any any pushback from the scientific community? Um, and, and I guess I was wondering, and you just kind of answered it a little bit, but what really motivated you to, to, to open up and, and talk about it in that specific case? Yeah, because I, because I post often to social media, and generally I don't track current events because they can change and, they, and the reporting might not be um, fully informed. So I try to look at what's going on and then take a step back and put something out there that is deeper than tracking any one news cycle versus another. So there's that. And so since I do do that, to have all of these protests going on during the pandemic at a time of national crisis, um, my not saying anything would be louder than me saying something. So I felt compelled to put something out there. And so I did. And I, I, I posted it with a link to my homepage and the homepage got overrun and it crashed the system. I guess that was a good, a good problem to have. They fixed it pretty quickly within 12 hours. And so now it's up. Um, I even, there's even a video of it with me narrating it. And some, there's some visuals that we put, the visuals all came after the fact. They were, there was written just as words, not as a narration to a video sequence. And so, yeah. And again, that's, since then I published a, you know, 400 page book on cosmic questions in the universe, but that will get people's attention because that's people gravitate to that. Um, but it remains a very, very tiny fraction of my professional output when I even go there at all. Yeah. And I, and I will say too, that as I was listening to it, you even still like it was very factual. And you still provided a lot of evidence to support what you were saying and what you were talking about. And I was like, wow, like a true scientist, you even approached that, um, that video. So I thought it was remarkable. I thought it was very uh, touching. And I think it was just beautiful. Well, thanks for noticing that. I can tell you, um, I was called to duty several times um, in the service of the White House in the uh, early 2000s, it began. Um, and I'm twice appointed by George W. Bush as sitting president. And so I am politically left of liberal, 
basically. I don't know if I'm completely leftist in the way that term is currently used, but definitely on the liberal side of all of my thoughts and all of my sense of what the future of the world should look like. Yet I was appointed into commissions to study the future of NASA was one of them. Another one was the future of the aerospace industry. My point is I got to meet educated people from, quote, across the aisle. All right. And so to have a conversation, I have to sort of walk from my sort of liberal corner and meet them in the middle. And then we had a conversation. And then I re- and when when I had that conversation, I looked back to where I came from. And I said, oh, my gosh, there's some thinking going on back there that is really underinformed, or that is uh, that is they think they're right. This is the tribalism that we so have. I, my views are right and you're wrong and I got to get rid of you. And have you really thought that through? Do you really understand what you're saying? Do you, do you, are you aware of the bias you are bringing on your own opinions because you are back in that corner? It reminded me of in 2014, Cosmos was to air on Fox. Okay? The more liberal you were, the more critical you were of that fact. How could it air on Fox? They got a bunch of idiots on Fox and Fox News, Fox, blah, 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 blah. and I say, do you even know what you're talking about? Yes, I do. And I said, so clearly they don't know what they're talking about because Fox is Fox flagship, okay, which is the main Fox channel on television. It's also Fox business. Yes, it's Fox news, but it's also 20th century Fox. By the way, 20th century Fox brought us Avatar. Did anyone accuse that of a liberal conspiracy? No. Fox searchlight pictures, the indie arm of Fox, brought Slumdog Millionaire to the screen and Little Miss Sunshine. And Fox flagship brought Family Guy. And if you go back to the 90s, they had In Living Color, possibly the most, the most progressive show there ever was on television. Okay? And, and so you, you just add all this up. And what happened is the farther left you were, the more tunnel vision you had. And you, painted, you paint with this blunt brush. Because it's easier to not have to think about the details or the nuances of what it is you believe. They're the good guys and the bad guys. And you anchor your whole life on that. And so I'm, I confess, I was deep in that along with them until I walked out into the middle of the ring. And then I said, oh my gosh, things look different from here. Just being in the, forget the other, just being in the middle, it looked different. And so I had to explain to people that it's on Fox flagship, which has the record of some of the most progressive programming there ever was on television. Yeah, that's 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 super that's super interesting. Uh, Kindly, uh, I mean, we, we're seeing that now more than ever. Yeah, as as people move to their corners and and are not interested in facts, and in fact, call facts lies they they say they're well, not interested no in facts fact. that would disagree with their view right right but mm-hmm. both yeah. sides are guilty yes yes but, but the consequences are different okay on on each side they're they're different so so for example um there's a what's like the best example of this um uh hmm so if you look at the liberal left criticizing the conservative right for their anti-environment views, specifically the denial of climate change and how that's been folded into a political platform. And people say, oh, you guys are anti-science, you're anti-this and that. Meanwhile, you look back in the liberal and where do you find all the crystal healers and the astrology readers and the feather energy people <laughs> and the psi energy people? They're all liberal. Every, all the yoga, all, all of it. All, all of it. Holistic okay. medicine. Okay, the alternative medicine. It's all anchored. And every one of those things I listed requires some rejection of mainstream science in order to hold that belief. And that is squarely based. The difference is that doesn't have existential consequences for civilization. (laughs) So that's a difference. All right. Right. That's an important difference, but you can't claim the high road that you embrace science while others don't. You can't. And I can see that when I step out of that corner and look back. That's, 
All right, so Neil, I wasn't going to bring this up, and and we won't this time just because we're going to run out of time here. Um, but I'm yeah, so I'm I'm a I'm a pastor outside of of the work that I do here. Cool. And so it is really funny, you know. So I'm I'm yeah, I'm sitting here, and I pastor. I'm, what church? What church you're in? Uh, I'm I'm in the United Pentecostal Church. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so if you know anything about Pentecost, you know we're again. It is really interesting. I've never thought though about this idea that like where my church is probably considered evangelical and sits over there to the right, that that there are folk on the left who are just it's not it's not Jesus and the Bible. It's crystals and and, and feather <laughs> <Correct. energy. laughs> Which, That's right. Someone did do a study, but I haven't seen it duplicated. Where they went around, they gave them a survey of their belief systems. You know, are you religious? Is Jesus the Son of God? Is Muhammad the last prophet? This sort of thing. So they gave them the, these surveys, and the survey contained other questions: Are you into crystal healing and, and and astrology and this sort of thing? And what they found was where religious um, adhere uh, religious followings were highest these new age belief systems were lowest. So Bible Belt, there's hardly any new age thinking at all. And then you go to like the Pacific Northwest, hardly anybody's religious, but the, the, the new age thinking and the pseudoscientific, uh, you know, channel medium energy to the dead people, all of that was higher. But if you add the two together, you get about the same percent of the population because they would change in an opposite sense to each other. So I thought that was interesting because it posed the question, um, if you if you tell people not to be religious and you convince them, no, don't be religious, then they could pick up all the... And if you convince these other people to take away their crystals and whatever, they could become religious because you're not really moving um, objectively rational thinking into a, po a segment of the population that may be just wired that way. This, this was the hypothesis in the paper. I thought that was interesting. Mm. Oh, by the way, just one point. Um, if uh, this is a hypothesis I have, and I think it's correct, but I need to do more research. The black church, however evangelical they've been historically, have never stepped into the classroom to try to alter what scientists teach. Whereas the fundamentalist white church sees science as a threat to them. I've never seen the black community in a black church, however Bible thumping they are, uh, fear my walking in the front door or try to pick at a school or to change a school curriculum. So the role of religion in the black community has been more of sort of a spiritual community rather than as something that is going to establish the next textbook on how God created the universe in six days. Extremely important uh, distinction, right? Because I, I just read a tweet too that, that reminded me of what you're saying is that, um, you know, Sure, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but what we're not going to debate is is people's ex like right to exist. And so that kind of reminded me of what you were uh, saying just now, uh, Neil. What we like to do on Black Brown and Bilingue, because we're looking at the time, um, we like to have our listeners walk away with one little nugget or jewel. Um, so if you had one thing that you wanted people to walk away with, with this interview, from this interview, what would that be? And, and, and let me jump in real quick and just say, it was really hard to find stuff to ask you that other folk haven't already asked you. Yeah, that's hard because I'm, I'm very public, right? So I, I think that's a good problem to have because it means I'm not hidden for what I, the messaging that I have. Uh, I would say that we should... Um, read more about how other people think. And that's important. That doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but you can at least understand it so that the next conversation you have can actually have some chance of being meaningful. Literally meaningful, where meaning is exchanged between the two of you rather than name calling or fights or, or brick, you know, or, 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 or gun shooting, right? Just, just try that. And <clears throat> that can be highly illuminating. 
You know, how long can you say, well, Trump is an idiot and he's this and he's that and he's that and said, how could anybody? Write? And then he got 74 million people to vote for him, more than anyone has ever voted for anyone in the history of the country other than Biden in that same election. So whatever your views are, half of America does not share them. If you're anti-Trump, don't you aren't you at least a bit curious about how, what what what's behind that? what's going on and why and how are they feeling? And, and so I spent a lot of my time just trying to understand other people. And I think that can go a long way. And, and also just remain curious. That's, I think that's part of the manifestation of my curiosity. How could you possibly think that? Let me find out. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a curiosity thing. Uh, curiosity can get you very far in this world. Maybe try to fan the flames of curiosity that you once had as a child because it's in there still, even if it's just an ember um, in need of a little oxygen. Yes, it's uh, it's like, uh, don't get furious, get curious. There right? you go. So wonderful uh, to have this opportunity to speak with you. Well, it's an honor to just be interviewed by or, or, or grilled <laughs> by two <laughs> school principals. Um, this is... I have an extra added layer of appreciation from what you guys do since my, as I said, my daughter teaches in the public schools of New York. And so she talks about a principal all the time, not always positive, <laughs> but you expect that. No, these are tough decisions right. you're making all right. the times. It's tough at the top, right? So, um, but just the, the dynamics of what it is to run a school, uh, I have a deeper appreciation for it because of that. So I just want to thank you. I will never forget that you're in the trenches. Aw, oh, thank you, Neil.